This morning we heard the dramatic news that a Russian warplane had been shot down by the Turkish military, allegedly uh, over Turkish uh, national territory. This account, of course, is uh, strongly denied by the Russians, who insist that the plane was in fact shot down over Syria. Now, of course, it's, it's uh, impossible for us to, to, to verify the claim, claims in one sense or another. But having seen even the Turkish uh, graphics of this uh, incident, it is clear even from the Turkish account that the, the Russian plane was in fact shot down over Syrian territory. The plane landed on Syri Syrian territory and the pilots, who it, it seems, escaped with their lives, managed to eject and also ended up inside Syrian territory. Uh, this, this is a serious matter, of course, because it's not a detail, because if the plane was in fact shot down over Syria outside of Turkish airspace, uh, this would amount to an act of war. Now, in a case of, of murder, the first question that is asked by uh, lawyers is to quote the Latin expression, cui bono? Who stands to gain from this? Well, the Russians clearly didn't stand to, to gain from having one of their planes shot down. On the other hand, the Americans, who lately have been striving for a deal with Russia, also had no interest whatsoever in this. And uh, if you were to ask yourself, who stands to blame, to, to game rather, from this uh, incident, then all of the arrows would point in one direction, and that's in the direction of the reactionary uh, president of Turkey, Erdogan. Now, it's generally been hushed up in the West. Uh, they don't talk about this, but it is a fact that Turkey, the uh, Erdogan regime, has been systematically supporting ISIS, supporting the terrorists, and supporting other terror groups related to Al-Qaeda in Syria with the aim of overthrowing the Assad regime. Uh, Erdogan himself is uh, an imperialist. He represents the interests of the ruling clique in, in Turkey. Above all, he, he represents his own personal interests. I think, in point of fact, He's obviously uh, an extremely ambitious, arrogant, uh, self-centered uh, man uh, with certain indications of, uh, of being mentally unbalanced. And he's built this huge presidential palace in the Ottoman style. And it would appear, without exaggeration, that Erdogan has the ambition of kind of re-establishing something resembling the Ottoman Empire, incredible though that may sound. This, this is not a new thing, this goes back for some years. He's definitely got territorial ambitions on Syria, for example. He wants to grab part of Syria, and therefore he insists that he must be part of any uh, negotiations concerning the future of Syria, and I think that that's the... Uh, the line that we should uh, investigate perhaps a little bit more. It goes beyond that in point of fact. He actually has got ambitions, as I say, of reconstituting something resembling the Ottoman Empire, including, for example, Central Asia, where he's been intriguing and manipulating and manipulating, to bring these areas under Turkish control. In order to do this, and that's perhaps another element, another strand in the, uh, in the investigation, if you want to call it that, He's been systematically using uh, those nations and national groups that speak uh, Turkic languages, uh, related to the Turkish language, like the Uzbeks, for example, and other groups, the Turkmens, who seem to have played a role in this latest uh, development. Because that part of Syria where the plane was shot, came down is occupied by the Turkmens. It's, it's a national group a national minority within Syria that speak a language that is somewhat rel related to Turkish, the, Tur the Turkmens. It would appear, and Putin's latest uh, statement on the incident uh, confirms this, 
that the reason that the Russians have been bombing that area, which is on the on the border with Turkey, it is true, is that the Turkmens have been involved, or Turkmen groups rather, financed and supported uh, from Turkey by Erdogan and by his gang, have been involved in large-scale smuggling of oil, oil produced in Syria in ISIS-controlled areas. So there you see a proof of Erdogan's direct and personal involvement with ISIS. Uh, these uh, gangs have been uh, using oil produced by, uh, under, under ISIS-controlled uh, regions to take that oil, to, to smuggle and import that oil across the frontier, frontier into Turkey. And what the Russians have evidently been doing is to try to stop that. By the way, that's in line with UN policy, that's in line with the West policy, which is supposed to be to cut off the, the financing uh, of ISIS, particularly in relation to oil. And Putin has stated quite correctly, in my view, that what this proves, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is Erdogan's direct support for ISIS. Now, that's not uh, a secret. Erdogan and the Turks have been systematically supporting ISIS and other uh, terrorist, uh, atrocious uh, jihadi groups in, inside Syria. They, for example, allow, uh, they were allowing, and they're still allowing, uh, ammunition and money and uh, volunteers and jihadis to cross the Turkish frontier quite quite freely and enter into ISIS-occupied territory to participate in their atrocious uh, their atrocious uh, behaviour. At the same time, he's been blocking systematically blocking the supply of arms and goods and volunteers to the Kurds. In fact, as we well know, Erdogan is not attacking ISIS at all. He's attacking the Kurds. He's attacking the PKK which is a force that's fight that's allied with, with America, as a matter of fact, in their fight against uh, these jihadi uh, monsters. So Erdogan, Erdogan's aim in this is quite clear. Now, what's the reason? Why should the Turks want to bring down uh, a Russian warplane? It's a very dangerous thing to do, of course. It's playing with fire in, in that respect. Well, of course, there is a reason for this. And the reason is fundamentally that in the recent period, in the recent weeks as a matter of fact, America and the West have changed their policy in relation to Syria and specifically in relation to Russia. Now, as I've stated on previous occasions, uh, it is the Russian military intervention in Syria that's been the decisive factor here. It's changed the entire military uh, correlation of, of forces. In, uh, in Assad's favour, it's uh, dealt heavy blows against the uh, jihadi uh, insurrectionists, the jihadi rebels, which of course d directly uh, goes against Turkey's in in interest, and that of Saudi Arabia. These, these gangsters are, are part of a bloc which has been systematically supporting the ISIS and the other <coughs> jihadi gangsters in the attempt to overthrow Assad. Now, Russia, of course, is determined to maintain Assad. Now, the West uh, don't like that. But because they've, uh, very late in the day, they've woken up to the threat posed by ISIS, particularly now since the Paris uh, atrocity, they've been compelled to reach an agreement with it, to try to reach some kind of an agreement or a modus vivendi with Russia, which would in, in, include inevitably accepting that Assad must stay. They say temporarily, yes, but how long is temporary? We don't know. How long is a piece of string? The fact of the matter is that they have to come to an agreement with, with Russia. They have to accept Putin's conditions. And his first condition is clearly that Assad must stay. The Russians, of course, have been bombing not just ISIS, but they've been bombing the other uh, jihadi crowd, linked to Al-Qaeda, by the way. Who were supposed to be part of the were supposed to were supposed to be part of the so-called moderate opposition backed by America. The Russians have been, the Russians have been bombing hell out of them. These are groups which have been and still are directly financed to the tune of, of billions of dollars by Turkey. Oh yes, by Turkey, a so-called uh, supposedly a member of NATO, pursuing its own agenda by Turkey, by Saudi Arabia, another alleged ally and friend of the West, these uh, monsters in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, the Qataris and other gangsters of that uh, type. 
They spent a lot of money. They've invested a lot of money in the jihadi cause to overthrow uh, Assad. And of course, they intend to take control of uh, what's left of, of Syria. Now, all the, the, the change in America's position, aligning themselves with Russia, or of course now with France, with Britain, there's a bloc being formed now. For the purpose of eliminating uh, the jihadi threat, the West has belatedly woken up to the fact that there is a threat, particularly, of course, since the Paris uh, massacre. That change flies directly in the face of the interests of Turkey, or rather of the uh, monsters that rule Turkey. You can't blame the Turkish people for this, of course. The Turkish people, let's remind ourselves, the masses in Turkey have been struggling to, to get rid of this gangster, uh, Erdogan. In uh, 2013, they staged a national insurrection, a heroic insurrection. There have been big strikes and demonstrations and so on. The Kurds, Kurdish people also, of course, are fighting to defend their national rights against this, uh, this reactionary monster, uh, Erdogan. But it goes against his interests. And therefore, it is uh, patently obvious uh, to, to me that Erdogan wanted to, 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 to strike a blow against that deal. His main interest, his main obsession, I think he's a little bit unhinged, so he's a bit uh, obsessive about these things. His main obsession is to, is, is to somehow destroy this deal, drive a, 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 a horse and carriage through, through the deal between, the, 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 the deal which is being forged between Russia and, and the West. The United Nations, I note, the United Nations in its recent uh, resolution that was carried, I think, unanimously, is not only directed against ISIS, it's, it specifically meant names other terrorist groups, groups that are aligned with Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Now, I think there you have uh, sufficient ingredients to, to understand the motivation behind this, uh, the downing of this plane. Uh, other explanations will not be put forward. Was it an accident? Was it pilot error? Maybe the navigation was out of order. Well, I, none of this holds water. The downing of a Russian warplane is such a serious act that of necessity any uh, military man, any soldier, any officer of the Turkish army or air force that did such a thing would not conceivably do this without permission from the highest possible level, by which I mean none less than President Erdogan himself. He gave permission for this. Have no doubts about that whatsoever. He gave permission. Therefore, it's a direct act of Erdogan and his gang, which has only got one possible motivation, which I've already explained. It's to destroy somehow. You see, Turkey is supposed to be a member of NATO, although it's some 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 kind of member. For years, they denied permissions to the Americans. They've only recently changed that to use the big uh, air, air base uh, inside Turkey against ISIS, for example. Another example of how they support ISIS and how they support terrorism and how they support reaction in this uh, part of the world. Turkey, in effect, is not acting as a member of NATO. It's not acting under American control, don't you believe it? They're acting in their own interest, in Erdogan's influence, to be uh, more precise. Therefore, they're like a rogue elephant. They, 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 they can't be controlled. The Americans are not very pleased at that as well. They prefer to have the stooges under control. But sometimes, as we know from history, these stooges can escape from their direct control. Erdogan is throwing his weight at them. What in, what effect, what in effect he's saying with this action of his, I have no doubt that it was his personal decision, what he's saying is this. To the Americans, this is a message to the, to the West. Don't think that you can exclude us from any little deal that you might have lined up in Syria. Don't think that we can be excluded. We got our own interests. We demand that our interests be represented. That's the message that's coming across. But of course, his actions in doing this uh, are extremely risky. He is, I think, a bit of a gambler, typical uh, adventurer in that sense. And he thinks, he obviously thought he could get away with it. I don't think he will get away with it. And I don't think he'll succeed in his intentions. Because, you see, the downing of a military plane is, of course, a serious matter. But in the, in the great order of things, it's merely a, an incident. It's small change, really. Even from the Russian point of view, really. Uh, what does it matter if they lose a plane or two? It doesn't make much difference to them. To the Americans, however... 
the uh, at the present moment in time, there's been a change, you see, in the last uh, few months and weeks. The pennies finally dropped in the thick head of the American uh, strategists. Uh, they're pretty thick, and they've made a mess of things in the Middle East. The, the pennies finally dropped that they need the support of Russia. They need the support, of course, of Iran. That's why they did a deal over the, the nuclear weapons uh, issue. And if the truth were to be told, they need to uh, arrive at some kind of a deal, even with Assad, to leave him where he is, at least for the time being. They've got no alternative. For That's the main plan, plank in their policy. As a matter of fact, in my view, it's the only plank in their policy. And therefore, even that this incident is not going to change very much, I don't think in relations between Russia and the West. Of course, in the short run, there'll be a terrible row. You see, Vladimir Putin, one has to see his uh, psychology, you know, he's a peculiar sort of man. But in any case, uh, his psychology is such that uh, if somebody is going to kick him, he's going to kick them twice or three times, hard. You saw that when they're down the, uh, the airliner recently. That was the, uh, a branch of the Al-Qaeda gang in... Uh, in the Sinai. He immediately began, bombed hell out of the uh, IS. And I've no doubt that he will retaliate. That's in his nature. He will retaliate against Turkey. And the West will have to accept. What form will the retaliation will take? I'm not quite sure. I think he, the, the, it will take some. It, somebody mentioned the possibility of cutting off the gas supplies to Turkey. I think that's quite uh, a possibility. That would be serious in the Turkish winter, which is very cold, of course. But either way, he will retire. Apart from anything else, apart from his personal psychology, uh, you see, his reputation is based upon uh, acting the tough guy, you know, and uh, standing up to America, standing up to all foreign but standing up to Turkey in this case, which he will do. His prestige depends on it, and his power depends on it, ultimately. On the power depends on his prestige. So he will re re retaliate. The question is, I, I note some, some uh, superficial observers are, or they always do this, I can't understand the psychology of these people. They all, they all, any, any crisis that occurs, they bring out the war drums, they, they, they're banging the war drums, talking about the Third World War. Well, this is, of course, is complete uh, and utter nonsense. Of course, superficially, there is, uh, there would appear to be a comparison with the situation in the Balkans in 1914, where all the great powers were entangled in the contradictions of the Balkans, which produced the World War. That is correct. And now, of course, it is true that in Syria, all, all the nations are, the big nations are involved, involved, the big boys are involved. America, Russia, Britain, France, and all their satellites and allies and so on, Iran, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and so on. They're also, even China, I, I see now, for what it's worth, has declared war on ISIS. So we will see what happens. That's true. Yes, but it's a very superficial analogies and uh, historical analogies. They, they they could be used. They can be useful, but they have limits, of course. And if you put push them beyond their limits, well, they're worthless, positively mis misleading, in fact. The reason why they they won't be a war, and you can rest uh, peacefully in your beds tonight. Don't don't worry about that. They won't. There won't be any war, at least in the short run there won't be any war, is because of the correlation of forces internationally. American imperialism, it is true, is the most powerful uh, and ferocious uh, armed imperialism that's ever existed. The power of the Roman Empire by comparison was trivial. That's perfectly true. Yes, but the power of American imperialism has got definite limits, you see. And these limits were exposed precisely in the Middle East, precisely in, in Iraq. They invaded Iraq. I think President Bush saw, uh, had seen too many John Wayne films. You know, the 7th Cavalry. So they invaded Iraq, yes. Iraq was already severely weakened. Its army was uh, already shattered by sanctions and so on. And therefore it was a piece of cake. They walked, they, 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 they walked into Iraq without any uh, difficulty. And you will recall George W. Bush's famous uh, <coughs> statement, mission accomplished at that time. Yes, of course, but now you have to ask yourself the question, what has been accomplished? And even from the standpoint of American imperialism, nothing has been accomplished except to cause a, a chaos throughout the whole region.
they plunged the whole region, the whole Middle East, into an abyss of chaos, of bloodshed, of wars, of terrorism, of collapse, of barbarism. American imperialism is responsible for that, together with the running dogs, the British, the French, and so on and so forth. They're responsible for this mess, ultimately. But now they've uh, woken up to the fact that they need to, to do something to st stop this jihadi menace, which they're responsible for, and therefore they have to come to a modus vivendi with Russia. So there's no question of a war with Russia, that's just absurd. Of course, they'll make a lot of, both sides will make a lot of noise. But then they always do. They did over Ukraine, you remember? All the threats and the fire and the brimstone and the ultimatums and the sanctions. What, is it, what did it amount to? At the end of the day, it amounted to nothing. You know, like Shakespeare said, it is a, 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 a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And that's the position, and that'll be the position now. They'll make a lot of noise, there'll be a lot of, there'll be a propaganda war. The Russians will take action of some sort, I don't know what, but they will do something about it. Turkey will not succeed, in my view, in the attempted provocation. And what this really shows, to sum up, is the extremely explosive nature now of the contradictions which have developed in the Middle East, of course, but on a world scale now. I don't know how many wars. Somebody said the other day, about 67, is it? Wars are taking place in the world at the present time. Not a world war. That's ruled out by the correlation of, uh, of forces. But there'll be small wars all the time, like, like the present wars in the Middle East. That doesn't mean that they're any uh, more barbarous or more bloody or more harmful to the cause of humanity than a big war. But what you have here is, is, is the symptoms of a system in terminal decline. That's what you have. And the crying contradictions which, that, uh, which flow from that, which inevitably lead to wars, terrorism, massacres, bloodshed and barbarism of all sorts. And the only way to stop that is to, to solve the problem, tear up the problem by the roots, by a root and branch transformation of society and the socialist revolution on a world scale.